Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. It is April 16th, 2024, and we have a great show for you today. First, Richard Allen. Well, his attorneys have filed more motions to keep some of his statements from being used against him. Alec Baldwin should be very concerned after the armor was sentenced yesterday. And uh, one of the many pending legal matters for the former president began yesterday, and well, we still don't have a jury. Let me give you an example. Call the police. Four are charged in regards to the missing preacher's wife and her friend. Let me give you an example of where a protest becomes criminal conduct and an example of what not to do in the courtroom. Then we have two stories that you just can't make this stuff up. And then you have the dumb criminal of the day, so you know it's got to be a doozy. All right, let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer. 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 Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk, the most fact-driven, unbiased true crime channel on the entire internet. All right, it is April 16th, 2024. Where were we yesterday? I don't know. I think I was recovering from my visit with the CPA, who at the last moment gave me some interesting news, to say the least. Anyway, I've recovered from the shell shock, and we are back today. Let's go ahead and open the record, and let's have our first matter on the docket. Richard Allen's attorneys want to block his interrogation. That's right, the attorneys for the Delphi murder suspect, Richard Allen, are asking the court, that's right, Judge Francis Siegel, to don't allow jurors to hear a recorded police interrogation claiming Allen is claiming that he was never advised of his Miranda rights during his interrogation. Now, the request to block the recording was filed yesterday. And uh, obviously, if you've been following the story, you know that Richard Allen was arrested back in October of 2022 and charged with two counts of murder in the 2017 slaying of 13-year-old Abigail Williams and 14-year-old Libby German. Now, the uh, Delphi, Indiana man has pled not guilty to all charges, and we have a trial coming up just next month. Now, the attorneys are also saying that Mr. Allen's civil rights were violated. The attorneys claim that the uh, Indiana State Police officials lied to Mr. Allen during the process of his interrogation. And according to court documents, they claim that either a camera was turned on minutes into the interview or the beginning of the interview was edited out. We'll have to wait and see how that turns out. I'm sure it was just faulty equipment or we forgot to start the recording. That's what they always say. And I don't know what went wrong. I'm being a little facetious there, ladies and gentlemen. So don't say, oh my God, Scott, you're so biased. Oh my gosh. Now, I don't know. I'm just telling you, I've seen over the years too many times where stuff's got erased, where it's been exculpatory uh, for the defendant. Now, I'm not saying that took place in this case. I was just being facetious. So relax. Anyway, both of Allen's attorneys write in their filing that in their 70 plus years of combined experience, they believe that this is highly unusual police behavior. And they also said that Mr. Allen was held in this small windowless interrogation room for over two hours without being allowed to leave. Now, like I said, this trial was supposed to go begin in October, but now it's scheduled for May. So let's see, what is the issue here framed out? We all know, because we are avid crime talk aficionados, you only need to be advised of your Miranda rights when you are in custody and you're being interrogated for the incident that has you under arrest, okay? So then the police have to come in and give the standard Miranda advisement. Do you understand that you're under arrest? You have a right to remain silent, anything you can and will be used against you. And you have a right to a lawyer. If you can't afford a lawyer, we'll get one for you, okay? And I've never seen anybody actually request that attorney, like, I can't afford one, but can I get one? And the cops are like, oh, gee, I don't know. He lawyered up, let's just leave it at that. Anyway, so that's what you have to do, in custody, and being interrogated. The issue is that Mr. Allen is alleging there were some misrepresentations that were made that are not on the video. Now, who could that help? Well, it could help Mr. Allen because he could say, this was promised to me and it's been deleted. Makes the cops look bad. If it was, if it was made or they didn't make those representations, you think you'd want to get that or reiterate that on the video. Now, I don't know what the truth is here. I don't know. I wasn't there. The court will have to make the decision, but remember 
This is in front of Judge Francis C. Gull, who has denied just about every motion filed by the defense. She hates the defense attorneys. She does not like Mr. Allen, and she loves the prosecution. Anyway, it is what it is. We'll have to wait and see if she sets it for a hearing. She has to set it for a hearing because it involves the deprivation of one's potential liberty and they've raised a constitutional issue. The government now has the burden of rebutting that allegation by clear and convincing evidence that there was no torture by keeping him in the room, confined with small windows. All those questions will be asked and the prosecution will have to explain that this is un not unusual. Uh, there were no threats. No one had their hands on their weapons or anything along those lines. They didn't beat him with a rubber hose, nothing along those lines. Prosecution has to show that by clear and convincing evidence to overcome the indication that um, these statements by Mr. Allen were obtained in violation of his Miranda rights. Next on the docket, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Remember the rust armor? She was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter back in um, in regards to the uh, shooting of, on the rust set back in October of 2021 of the cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Well, she got sentenced. And we'll get to that in a second, but ladies and gentlemen, who should be trembling in their shoes right about now? I'm sure he's not, but Alec Baldwin, all right? Alec Baldwin and his attorneys took a poke the finger in the prosecution's eye as soon as this case started. They started throwing allegations around. The defense scored a couple of victories. They got the prosecutor disqualified. They brought in a special prosecutor. Prosecutor said, game on. Let's do this thing. They dismissed the case because they didn't think they could prove it. They had to wait on some expert reports regarding the firearm. They then refiled, got that indictment against um, Mr. Alec Baldwin, and now he's charged and motions are coming up and trials coming up at the end of the summer. And here we have the co-defendant, Helena Hutchinson, found of this negligence. Remember what we talked about negligence, ladies and gentlemen? Involuntary manslaughter. It's basically a negligent, maybe recklessness, right? Alec Baldwin should be saying, oh my goodness, if she can be found guilty, certainly I could because I'm the one that fired the firearm. <gasps> That's right. So little practice pointer here. Don't go into jurisdictions that you're not familiar with uh, poking fingers in people's eyes because you, in this case, Mr. Baldwin's attorneys may have to go back in their hat in hand to uh, ask for that very favorable disposition that they had offered to Mr. Baldwin and he rejected it, as I recall, that included no jail time. And so not good for Mr. Baldwin. And what he also has to consider is wow, if we're going to send the lowly armorer to prison, they could do that to me too. So things just got very real for Alec Baldwin. All right, like I said, Miss uh, Reed Gutierrez was uh, sentenced yesterday and uh, she was sentenced to 18 months in prison. The judge, Mary Summers, imposed the maximum penalty of 18 months in the New Mexico Women's Correctional Facility. Now, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed did not testify in her own defense. She read a statement in court, and I quote, first and foremost, my heart aches for the Hutchins family and the family and colleagues as well. It has since the day of this tragedy occurring. She called Ms. Hutchins an inspiration to her and understood that she was taken too soon, and I pray that you all find peace. Like I said, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, she was in charge of the prop guns on the project, which was co-produced by Alec Baldwin, who held the weapon that actually was discharged while it was in Alec Baldwin's hand and killed Ms. Hutchinson back in October of 2021. Now, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed admitted that she was young and naive when she took the rest job and that in her uh, statement, she noted that she's saddened by the way media sensationalized her traumatic tragedy and portrayed her as a complete monster, which has actually been the complete opposite of what is in her heart. Now, jury members, like I said, found her guilty uh, for the death of Miss Hutchins, and she was, however, cleared of a separate charge of tampering with evidence. And uh, obviously her attorneys have stated that they are going to appeal. So what does this really mean? 
Well, let me give you another practice pointer when it comes to sentencing. You may completely disagree, and you know there were some statements, and Ms. Gutierrez referred to the jurors as a bunch of idiots in this particular case. But when you go to sentencing, whether you like it or not, you have been found guilty. Um, usually, the best thing to say when there is going to be an appeal is, on advice of counsel, I'm not going to say anything. Instead, what Ms. Gutierrez Reed did here is, she tried to make herself to be the victim. Like, sure, it's sad that Miss Hutchins is dead and everything, but everybody's portrayed me as a complete horrible person. And that's just simply not the case. It doesn't really matter, okay, when you go to court. And if you've ever listened to me long enough, you know the 12 undeniable truths of life from a criminal defense attorney. There are two types of people in the world, those that are humble and those that are about to be. Miss Gutierrez Reed has been humbled and Mr. Baldwin will be humbled as well. Because like I said, he has two counts of involuntary manslaughter as well. He pled not guilty, faces the same 18 months up in prison. And uh, that trial will begin in July. Obviously, we'll give him the presumption of innocence, but he's got to be worried. And guess what? The prosecution's already done this case once. You think they're going to tweak it, make it a little better the second time around? A little added juice for Mr. Baldwin? Oh, yeah. And why? We talked about it, I think, last week, the pleadings that the attorneys for Mr. Baldwin filed, not. I mean, it got personal. And then the prosecution got personal again. And they're like, okay, game on. It's going to get interesting. Next on the docket, yes, the trial of former President Trump, the hush money case that is uh, going on in New York with some unique legal theories. But obviously, the matter has made it this far, and now the former president will be sitting in court for up to the next six weeks uh, when he wants to be out campaigning. Now, the judge has stated that he is not going to allow the former president to take uh, the day off to go to his son Barron's high school graduation. Uh, but apparently, the court is not conducting court on Wednesdays because he does some volunteer work on those days. So we'll see. Listen, I, I, I'm sympathetic, not sympathetic. Uh, the reality of it is I've had clients that have had to miss lots of things. I've missed lots of things in my life because I had to be in court. So um, unfortunate timing, but those are the kinds of things that should have been set when this case was set. Uh, but for whatever reason, it wasn't. So anyway, yesterday, there was the first shot at uh, trying to get a jury to decide whether these uh, payments to the porn star Stormy Daniels to cover up an alleged affair. Now, the jury is going to be of 12 uh, people plus six alternates, and it's going to be a little difficult. They brought in 100 people yesterday and almost immediately dismissed 49 of them. Uh, I've been following the live information as it comes out, and the taping of this video, they still don't have more than a two or three jurors that have been uh, basically screened and qualified. Uh, one lady was literally living under a rock, and I don't mean that too literally, but she was uh, living out by a lake uh, with no internet, no TV, and she basically said, hey, I can give that man a fair trial. Well, that's all you can ask for, because like I said, out of the 100 49 said they could not uh, be fair to the former president. At some point, the judge may have to wonder, gee, is this a motion for a change of venue if we can't get 12 qualified people plus six alternates in this particular case? I don't know. A lot of people have been saying that. I don't know. So what is the issue in this particular case? Obviously, the president, this case goes back to 2015-2016, uh, and then private citizen Trump wanted to make sure that uh, there was no talking about this alleged affair, whether it happened or not. People settle with people all the time in civil cases. Hey, you did something to me. No, I didn't. Uh, I want $100 million. Okay, will you take 5000 Sure. People settle all the time. Don't admit fault. Don't do anything. People sign non-disclosure agreements all the time. In this particular case, the now former president says he knew nothing about it, that he did nothing wrong, but this person was making claims or allegations or there was talk of it. So they took the peremptory action to make it go away. The uh, 
president had Michael Cohen, who's now a convicted felon, completely turned on the president and said, yeah, I did this. It was all at the president's direction. Uh, he paid Stormy Daniels $130,000 in hush money from his own equity, home equity line of credit and then got reimbursed. The Trump organization um, listed it as uh, attorney's expenses and fees. And uh, the state of New York is saying, hey, that wasn't a an attorney expense. That was hush money. And uh, you violated the law. Where things get interesting is, is that you have to show which law you violated. The state has never said exactly which law. The feds turn this case down uh, because they couldn't say what necessary law was violated. But the state of New York and the district attorney, Alvin Bragg, have tried to bootstrap the violation of a federal law to make it a felony. Otherwise, statute of limitations would have run and expired, uh, and it would have been a misdemeanor. Um, unique, novel stuff. Some people say no one's above the law. Other people say it's uh, lawfare. You decide, ladies and gentlemen. You decide. Uh, because um, I assure you, no matter what I say, or what I think, someone will say, oh my gosh, you're anti-Trump. Or if I say it the other way, oh my God, you support President Trump, we're unsubscribing. Not that I'm worried about that at all, but frankly, I'd rather see your comments to see where this comes down. So let me know. Is this a uh, travesty of justice or is this holding somebody accountable because nobody is above the law. Next, why you should just call the police. So an 81-year-old man in Ohio is now being charged with murder after a scam phone call led to the shooting of a 61-year-old woman who was an Uber driver. So according to a press release by the Clark County Sheriff's Office, police responded to a uh, home about 11.18 a.m. in Clark County. The communications center received a 911 call from a resident who claimed to have shot someone who was attempting to rob him. Okay, seems everything's going okay. When the police arrived on scene, though, they discovered a woman suffering from multiple gunshot wounds, and that was later identified as Lolita Hall of Columbus, Ohio. Police were also made contact with the caller, this guy, 81-year-old William Brock um, Sar of South Charleston, Ohio, who had uh, suffered an injury to his head and ear. Now, the investigation revealed that Brock had just been the subject of a scam call concerning an incarcerated relative, which turned into threats and a demand for money. As the police continued to kind of figure out what was going on, it was revealed that Hall, an Uber driver, was also a victim of a scam call from the same caller or accomplice. Hall had been asked through the Uber app to pick up a package from Mr. Brock's residence. Hall arrived at the residence and asked Brock about the package that she was supposed to retrieve through her Uber app. Upon being questioned by Ms. Hall, Mr. Brock then pulled out a firearm and held her at gunpoint, demanding for Hall to reveal the identities of the people that he had spoken with on the phone. Brock also took Hall's cell phone number to uh, prevent calls and refused to allow Hall to leave the scene. So Mr. Brock, during the entire encounter, made no attempt to call 911 for assistance in any way. And Hall attempted to re-enter her vehicle and escape, during which time she was shot by Mr. Brock. Now, Brock chased after her and was injured in the subsequent scuffle at the door of Miss Hall's vehicle. The two continued to fight, causing Mr. Brock to shoot Hall once more before shooting her again a third separate time. Now, only after shooting Hall for the third time did Mr. Brock decide to contact the police. Needless to say, ultimately, uh, paramedics arrived for Miss Hall. She was uh, transported to the hospital where she died of her injuries. Now, due to there being no active threat presented by Ms. Hull at the time during the encounter, Mr. Brock's failure to contact authorities for assistance while brandishing the firearm uh, during which he fired and struck Ms. Hull multiple times, he's been charged with murder. Other charges are possible pending further review of evidence of uh, Mr. Brock's actions in the incident. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, um, firearms are a great equalizer. Right? If there's multiple people coming at you, 
you equalize it by having a firearm. They can be great tools of deterrence. But if you get something wrong, man, you're going to prison, okay? Um, and a lot of states don't have duty to retreat. I get all that. But if you get it wrong, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to prison, okay? Mr. Brock messed this thing up big time. He had no idea if this woman was involved or not. She clearly didn't know what was going on. Hell, it's on video for God's sakes. He shoots her. Okay, there's at least a first degree assault, some sort of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Chases her down, she's trying to get away. She's unarmed, shoots her not once, but two more times. Now there may be some mitigating factors here. He was confused, he was upset, he didn't know, maybe she's part of the scam, but there was still no deadly force required, at least from what we can see and what we know right now. So, I get it. We believe in all the amendments, but I also tell clients all the time. I, I appreciate firearms. I possess firearms, but they complicate everything when it comes to the legal system. So you better be right. You better be right. Next, the two missing women in Oklahoma have been found. So the two Kansas women who went missing on a trip to pick up a child for a birthday party two weeks ago were killed over a custody dispute involving a small group of anti-government Oklahomans who called themselves God's Misfits. Now, the uh, car that was found along a rural Oklahoma highway just south of the state line with ample evidence of a bloody confrontation set off a two-week effort to find the uh, child and make sure they were safe while searching for the women and to avoid more violence. Ultimately, their bodies were found a day after four suspects were arrested without incident on charges of kidnapping and murder. So Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly of Huginton, Huginton, Kansas, had arranged with the grandmother of Miss Butler's two children to meet at a highway intersection and pick up six and eight-year-olds uh, for a March 30th birthday party in Kansas. Butler's family found the vehicle just a few miles from the meetup spot after the uh, women missed the party. Now, the suspects arrested include 54-year-old Tiffany Adams, who was the children's grandmother, and three others who call themselves God's misfit, according to the arrest affidavit. Now, Adams is 43 years old. Tad Cullum is 50. Cole Twombly is 44. And Cora Twombly are all charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy to commit murder in the first degree. Now, the arrest affidavit alleges that Butler was in a problematic custody dispute with Adams. Her son, the father of Butler's two children, was in a rehabilitation facility in Oklahoma City hours away from uh, Guyman, uh, Oklahoma, and Butler was allowed only supervised visits each Saturday. Now, Kelly, the wife of the pastor in Huginton, was Butler's court-authorized choice to supervise visitations. As the investigators did their investigating, they found that Adams told them that she left the children in the care of another couple on the morning of March 30th. The couple was this God's misfit, according to the rest affidavit, and guess what? Some blood was found on the roadway at the edge of the roadway where they were supposed to meet. Butler's glasses were also found on the roadway uh, near a broken hammer. Now, a pistol magazine was found inside Kelly's purse at the scene, but no pistol was found. Now, a teenage witness told the police that Cora Twombly said that she and her husband, Cole Twombly, blocked the road to stop Butler and Kelly and divert them to where Adams, her boyfriend, Cullum, and another person were waiting for them. The teen asked why Kelly had to die and was told that she wasn't innocent either because she supported Ms. Butler. This is all according to the rest affidavit. The affidavit also said that according to Cora Twombly, at one point, the plan was to throw an anvil through Butler's windshield while driving, making it look like an accident because, you know, anvils fall all the time off of work vehicles there in Oklahoma. The police revealed that uh, no details uh, in regards to the in a news conference as to where the bodies were found, but the affidavit does say that prepaid phones bought by Tiffany Adams stopped transmitting that morning not far from the crime scene. Oh, those pesky phones. And guess what they also found? That's right, the uh, car rented by Tad Cullum, where a hole had been dug and filled back in and then covered with hay. 
Now, the property owner said that he saw a column using heavy equipment to dig a hole back on March 29th, and the issue that uh, Butler had asked the court for more time uh, with his children, and Butler's attorneys told investigators that her request for unsupervised visitation was likely to be granted at a hearing in April. Now, the Oklahoma Court of Civil Appeals issued a ruling back in 2022 directing a trial court to enter a shared custody arrangement. We acknowledge that both of these very young and immature parents presented conflicting testimony about the other party's inappropriate behaviors and choices, the appellate court wrote, but said the children are nurtured and comforted by mother and happy and excited to be with father. So then on March 23rd, with uh, the court date looming, Adams bought five stun guns at a store, according to the affidavit. It wasn't entirely clear where the children were throughout the crime. Now, the authorities uh, did unseal the affidavit on uh, Monday, and uh, they filed it, obviously, uh, to protect their uh, officers and to keep the children out of harm's way. All four of the suspects are being held without bond in the Texas County Jail and are scheduled to make an initial appearance tomorrow morning. And um, as of right now, no bond hold. That's reasonable when you're accused of double murder. Next on the docket, let's give an example of where free speech ends and true threats begin. All right, this is some interesting video. And don't get me wrong, I am a firm free speech advocate. Put it all out there, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let people decide based upon the better argument, the uh, better position. The good arguments will come to be believed. The bad arguments will fade away. But you have to have uh, both sides of the argument presented so that the best decision can be made. So we believe in free speech here at Crime Talk. But we also understand there's certain things you can't do. And you can't cross the line. And that's when it turns into a true threat. So take a look at this protester who threatened to murder the Bakersfield City Council members uh, last Wednesday. And uh, guess what? She made her first court appearance last Friday. Please meet Riddy Patel. Now she's 28 and look at her trying all those big old tears at the, arrange at the arraignment. Well, she was ultimately escorted out of the city council meeting after she uh, threatened the city council members with death who were weighing a Gaza ceasefire resolution. Now, Ms. Patel has pled not guilty in all those charges, and we'll give her the presumption of innocence. Uh, but Ms. Patel said, I remind you that these holidays that we practice, that other people in the global South practice, believe it in violent revolution against their oppressors. And I hope one day somebody brings the guillotine and kills all of you mother effers. Ms. Patel also said to the city council, in the last five years I've attended city council meetings, there's never been metal detectors, there's never been more cops. The only reason you're doing it is because people actually don't care if you guys don't like them and they're actually resisting, so you're trying to criminalize them. We'll see you at your house, they added. We'll murder you. Whereupon the mayor calmly responded and said uh, to Ms. Patel, that was a threat, and uh, you see those officers over there? They're going to escort you out of here and take good care of you. And Ms. Patel did get good taken care of. That's right. Booked on 18 felony charges related to those threats intent to terrorize and threatening city council staff. And guess what? Her bond is $1 million. Interesting, isn't it? I'm going to come do all these terrible things to you. They're going to kill these people. That's what she threatened. That is a threat, ladies and gentlemen. That is not protected free speech. If she said, you're the worst city council ever, you have the worst policies ever, uh, your parents should be embarrassed by everything that you do or say, your children should be, your family should be embarrassed of you, uh, you have uh, not a single brain cell based upon whatever policies you follow. Completely protected free speech. True threats, not protected free speech. You can't go around threatening people, ladies and gentlemen. You've been warned, all right? You can be nice. You can be respectful. You can't threaten people. Next on the docket, what not to do in the courtroom. This is poor courtroom etiquette. So there was a sentencing hearing for a man who pled guilty to murder. Well, needless to say, it turned into a little courtroom melee. 
Now, family members of the victim leaped across the barrier to attack the convicted killer. Now, the uh, judge, a Judge Robert Mullen, had just given the defendant a 45-year sentence. That defendant is Jason Serville in connection with the murder of Alice Abbott that took place back in July of 2022. That's when uh, Jeremy Pratt, Serville's attorney, asked to have a conversation at the bench. As uh, Pratt, another defense attorney, and the state prosecutor approached the bench, Clifford Warren, the brother of the victim, surged from his seat in the gallery over the railing, knowing as the bar and, uh, and uh, crossed about 20 feet to attack Mr. Serville. Now, Mr. Warren was stopped by the um, deputy in the courtroom who had to deploy a stun gun. And guess what? He was ultimately escorted off to custody. Uh, now, some of Abbott's family members who attended Friday's sentencing shouted and tried to reach Mr. Serville, but they were stopped by the court marshals. And Miss Abbott's mother also shouted, he deserves to die. He should get stabbed just like her daughter was. Anyway, needless to say, not the way to um, conduct yourself in court, ladies and gentlemen. Poor taste, lack of class in any way. Understand courtrooms can be a very stressful and terrifying time for some people involved. Most good things don't happen in a courtroom, all right? It just doesn't, at least not in a criminal courtroom. You're not going to get justice. You're going to get punishment. Okay? No one's going to bring back your loved one. No one's going to repair, repair anything. They're not going to pay the restitution. It just usually never turns out that way. Now, don't get me wrong. Mr. Seville, who stabbed his victim 99 times, probably deserved a good old-fashioned butt kicking by the family members. But we don't do that here. Um, so what can you do? Right? What can you do? Well, don't attack the defendant in court because that's just going to, that's right, going to get you charged, ladies and gentlemen. So just remember that next time you go to court, don't jump at the defendant. Don't jump over the court's bench to attack the judge, as we've seen recently in Las Vegas. I don't know, just uh, behave yourself. Don't act a fool, ladies and gentlemen. All right, next in the docket, got a couple of stories if you just can't make this stuff up. First, a transgender woman... Uh, who identifies as a vampire, has been convicted of sexually assaulting a developmentally disabled girl, while already investigation for allegedly strangling a man possessed by a demon. Please meet Adam Hetke, or as he likes to be called, Sabrina. Well, he was convicted in uh, Wisconsin last week on first-degree sexual assault by threatening the use of a dangerous weapon and second-degree assault of a mentally ill victim. Now, Hetke was already a convicted sex offender and under investigation for a homicide, which charges only filed since the disturbed attacker was busted for the sexual assault. Now, Hetke um, met her latest known victim, a 16-year-old girl with cognitive disabilities at a gas station back in July of 2021, where he took her home and uh, sexually assaulted her while threatening to use a knife. The girl said Hetke told her that he was a vampire and that he would bite her if she didn't do what he wanted, according to the criminal complaint. Now, Hetke was wearing a one-piece swimsuit under her clothes and carrying a knife when approached by police. Now, the uh, convicted sex offender who was released from prison back in November of 2020 also faced his charges in an open homicide case in Milwaukee. Now, he, she was arrested on a uh, tentative uh, charge of first degree intentional homicide back in April of 2021 for the death of Vidalia Thomas Moody, a 28 year old who had a cognitive disability as well. The victim was strangled with a cord inside a home in the Concordia neighborhood of Milwaukee on the west side, apparently. And uh, Hetke, he, she, told the Milwaukee police that the young man was possessed by a demon and began stabbing himself in the uh, chest with tongs. Anyway, Hetke said, said that he, she, managed to exercise that demon, but that the demon caused Thompson Moody to wrap a cord around his neck and uh, pull the ends quite tight, according to the arrest affidavit. One witness said he was scared of Hetke, who also went by the name Morgan, and claimed that uh, he, she could inject demons into people's bodies. Now, Hetke told a witness 
uh, he, she would place a demon inside the victim and kill him because he disrespected he, her, her, him, then allegedly admitted to another witness that she killed him. I killed him. God can't bring him back, but I can because I am the devil, Hetke. Well, news says the suspect was arrested within 24 hours of the crime, but was soon released with no charges formally filed. And ultimately, when the police arrived at the West Wells Street home, they found Mr. Thompson Moody on the floor with a 14-foot electrical cord under him and marks on his neck and forehead, according to the police affidavit. After a week in jail, Hetke was discharged by the uh, county sheriff on administrative relief, a designation that typically means prosecutors aren't yet prepared to file charges. Now, all the witnesses who were originally uncooperative eventually told police that after being released from jail, Mr. Miss Hetke returned home and admitted to killing Mr. Thompson Moody intentionally, but it took two months for the prosecutors to pursue those charges. And then Hetke was ultimately charged with the Thompson Moody death until almost two weeks after he was jailed in the different county. The homicide case is expected to go to trial in June, and uh, we'll try to follow up on that one. Demons, vampires, clearly Mr. Miss Hedke has a type. They like or have to be disabled individuals. Not cool, Mr. Miss Hedke. Yes, the teacher in the student's car naked. That's right. You can't make this up, ladies and gentlemen. But although it seems to be coming a little more frequent, doesn't it? Anyway, the Nebraska teacher accused of sexually abusing a teenage student has uh, shown up in court and looks a little uh, disheveled after her first court appearance, where her bail was set at $25,000. Now, this is in Omaha, Nebraska, ladies and gentlemen. If you've ever been to Omaha, Nebraska, this is like the place where you want to raise a family. Okay, nice city. Yeah, a couple of bad spots, but this is like Mayberry RFD kind of stuff. All right. Anyway, look at Erin Ward. Looks a little dazed and disheveled in her mugshot there in Douglas County. Well, she appeared in court uh, on Tuesday morning in her orange jumpsuit to face one count of felony sexual abuse by a school employee. Now the judge said, ma'am, you're charged with a class 2A felony. That is punishable by up to 20 years in prison, a $10,000 fine, or both. Do you understand those consequences? Miss Ward replied, yes, I do. And then she was advised, you may have to enroll in the state sex offender registry if you're convicted of this. Needless to say, the uh, married mother of three looked a little shocked. And, but she apparently did admit to having sex with a 17-year-old student after the pair were caught in the backseat of a car belonging to Miss Ward and her husband, who is some big muckety-muck at the Department of Defense. So before the arrest, Ms. Ward worked as a substitute teacher at several schools there in uh, Omaha. And apparently she met the teenage boy with whom she was found in the early morning hours of April 13th. At about 3 a.m., the police officers, the uh, deputy sheriff in this case, were called to investigate a suspicious car parked at a dead-end street. Guess what the police found? Well, they found Ms. Ward and the victim, the 17-year-old teenage boy, inside a Honda Pilot, ultimately determined to be owned by Ms. Ward and her husband. And the 17-year-old jumped into the driver's seat and sped off in the car, crashing it into a yard about two blocks away. He then ran away wearing only a t-shirt, boxers, and socks, and was found about an hour later. Now, the police found an Omaha Public School employee ID from inside the car, where Ms. Ward confirmed that she was a substitute, where coincidentally, the teen was enrolled, and like I said, she admitted to having sexual intercourse with him. Now, apparently both she and the uh, victim, the 17-year-old boy, were taken to the hospital and treated for minor injuries as a result of the crash. And uh, the police said that, guess what? They don't believe that this car incident was the first time that Ms. Ward had had sex with the 17-year-old boy. Oh, my gosh. That is mind-blowing police work. Absolutely mind-blowing. Really? A 40-something-year-old woman's out at 3 a.m. in the morning with a 17-year-old boy. Yeah, they didn't the first time, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, now guess what? The age of consent in Nebraska is 16, and the teacher was uh, not charged with statutory rape, but faces, like I said, this uh, Class 2A felony, which carries up to 20 years in prison. Now, Miss Ward's husband, William Douglas Ward, 
He's a Harvard man, and he is the uh, deputy at the Department of Defense. Uh, Doug, the husband, Doug Ward, was appointed the deputy director of the Commander's Action Group and senior nuclear deterrence advisor at the United States Strategic Command there in um, Nebraska. You know, people used to lose security clearances for stuff like this. I wonder if Mr. Ward will get his security clearance revoked for not knowing what was going on with Mrs. Ward. I don't know. Anyway, I'm sure it's an awkward dinner table at the Ward household right now, don't you think? Miss Ward and her husband and three kids. So, anything new happened today, Mom? Uh, is this 17-year-old boy, is he going to be our new stepdad? I mean, those are the kind of questions that are going to be asked, ladies and gentlemen. All right, and just when you thought it couldn't get any stranger or more bizarre, wait, there's more. We have the dumb criminal of the day. A Missouri man is facing a felony theft charge for allegedly lifting eight luxury vibrators from an adult store and then trying to fence them, wait for it, on Facebook Marketplace. Please meet Christopher Michael Booth. He was charged in a felony complaint with stealing, the, stealing these vibrators valued at some $1,500 from a Hustler Hollywood outlet in St. Louis. Now, the uh, sex toys were uh, retailed for about $200 a piece, and uh, they were manufactured by a Swedish company. Who knew? And they advertise itself as one of the world's leading designer brands for intimate lifestyle products. Maybe that's why Mr. Uh, Booth was so inspired. Anyway, Mr. Booth uh, last month allegedly took the uh, uh, vibrating pleasure toys from a display, placed them in a white trash bag, and then ran from the store. The police were contacted, and the employees recognized the suspect because he'd been in the store earlier that week and actually argued uh, with the staff before leaving. Anyway, the uh, man, the workers also recalled, had a number, a very distinguished number that they remembered across, what was it? Oh, that's right, his neck. The number's 314, tattooed across the top of his neck, which is the area code for St. Louis. Makes identification a heck of a lot easier. Doesn't it, ladies and gentlemen? All right. That's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. And remember, it's Tuesday, which means we're going live at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. And then immediately following that, we have our Patreon show. Please join us. We'd love to talk with you. And remember, and never forget, yes, the Constitution matters. Mm -hmm.